Now, our first speaker this morning, well, let me put it this way. As a young man, I had a chance on several occasions to visit the Soviet Union as one of the members of these delegations we used to send back and forth during the Cold War to try to make friends and influence people, you know, that kind of thing. And we'd be there for about a week and all think of ourselves as great authorities on, and usually be asked to speak when we got back to various groups about, you know, you know our wisdom on the Soviet Union. And I remember during that time a book by um, a guy who was the Moscow bureau chief in the Soviet Union called The Russians. Well, I have to read this. And I read the book. I couldn't quote you everything. I remember this was, you know, what, 30 some years ago. But I do remember something like the opening line that was a real comeuppance for, for those of us who thought ourselves authorities. It was there are two kinds of authorities on the Soviet Union and the Russians. Folks who've been there less than two weeks and folks who've been here considerably more than two years. And I realized that most of what most of us knew about the Russians was probably um, very, very, very um, skewed, um, superficial, and ignorant. And that book taught me a great deal. The author of that book is here as our first speaker this morning. Uh, Mr. Hedrick Smith is a Pulitzer Prize winner from the New York Times. And during his almost three decades in the New York Times, he worked with the team that produced the Pentagon Papers. And in 74, won his own Pulitzer for international reporting for Russia and Eastern Europe. Uh, and his many books, including the one I just mentioned, The Russians, uh, have been bestsellers including his current book, Who Stole the American Dream, which is what we've asked him to talk to us about this morning in the context of our conference. His book, The Power Game, How Washington Works, became such a classic that President Clinton kept it on his bedside table, and many other Washington politicians used it as their handbook, uh, their guide to the Washington insider beltway game. Hedrick Smith has created 26 primetime specials and miniseries on varied topics such as Inside the Terrorist Network, Is Walmart Good for America, The People in the Power Game, Inside Gorbachev's USSR, and Duke Ellington's Washington. He's won most of television's top awards, including two Emmys, two Public Service Awards from Sigma Celtic High, two DuPont Columbia Gold Batons awarded for the best public affairs program on American television, in 1991 and again in 2002. It is a real honor for us to have Mr. Hedrick Smith speak to us this morning. Sir. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Lucas, for that overly generous introduction, Admiral and, and colleagues. It's a great honor for me to be here, to be invited to speak to this august group in this uh, marvelous setting. I had a home not too long ago on the Magathy River. I used to sail over here. I'd love to come by. So it's nice to be on the inside, on the land, not just looking at the, at the academy from the, from the shore, uh, from the sea. I must say that uh, I'm really pleased to look at the words being used at the heading of this gathering and at the heading of this institution. Stockdale Center for Ethical Leadership, the ethical dimensions of extraordinary national challenges. As I was doing my morning exercises in the bedroom over at the BOQ this morning, NPR was broadcasting a survey by the Pew Charitable Trust, Pew Center for the Media of the People, and the key issue was the loss of public trust in leadership in major U.S. institutions, starting with the government, of course, but running through business and certainly the media. I didn't hear the, the military mentioned terribly badly, so you came out quite well, and you've got a model that the rest of us should pay attention to. But I think the topic of ethical leadership is appropriate to the subject I want to talk about this morning. But first, let me say that I'm so pleased that the Admiral Superintendent uh, mentioned Monty Python because I was debating in my mind whether or not I dared say that America's situation today reminded me of a cartoon in Peanuts. And I thought, well, no, this is too serious a group of people. I'm not going to use Peanuts, but now you open the way, so I'll go ahead and do it. It's that cartoon where Lucy has a card table set up in the back room and it says, Psychiatry One Cent. 
And you know who walks up. Charlie Brown walks up, puts down his pen. He says, Lucy, I need some advice. She says to Charlie, before I can give you any advice, I need to have you think of, and you'll like this, a voyage on a great ocean liner, a great vessel. Now there's one group of people and they take their deck chairs to the bow and they look into the future to see where they're going. And there's another group and they take their deck chairs to the stern and look back to see where they've come from. Which group do you belong to, Charlie? And Charlie scratched his head for a moment. He said, Lucy, I'm having trouble getting my chair unfolded. <laughs> So uh, as I sat down to start working on this book, Who Stole the American Dream, uh, that's the shape America was in in 2009. Nobody, it didn't take any genius to see, and actually my title of the book at that time was The Dream at Risk, that we were in trouble, losing 600,000 jobs a month, people being foreclosed out of their homes, Wall Street had collapsed, people weren't sure whether or not the economy was going to go into a nosedive that would take us into a new depression or not. Uh, and so I began thinking, how did we get here over the period, you were generous, Mr. George, I will say only 30 years of reporting at the New York Times, I've been reporting for 50 years. Um, what had happened over the half century that I've been reporting, because I remembered a different America uh, in my earlier years as a reporter and growing up. And uh, I began looking at, uh, at writings that had impressed me over time, and I came across a quote from John Gardner who had died just before uh, I was starting my research. And he said something that really struck me, eloquent, profound, challenging. We are treading the edge of a precipice here. Civilizations die of disenchantment. If enough people doubt their society, the whole venture falls apart. We must never let anger, fashionable cynicism, or political partisanship blur our vision on that point. We must not despair of the republic pretty potent terms. And remember, he issued those words before we went into the collapse. And then I got thinking back to some of the reading I'd done and studying I'd done at Oxford, and I thought of that great British historian, Arnold Toynbee, who studies the history of civilizations in 10 volumes. I have to admit, I only read one of them. The one that summarized the other 10, or actually there were, there were two of them. <laughs> that was known as the Cliff Notes on Toynbee <laughs> at that time. But that was a lot of reading as it was. And I remember Toynbee talking about the rise and fall of civilizations in terms of challenge and response. That all civilizations face challenges and they all have to respond successfully or they wither and gradually fade away. And he started out with ancient Egypt and some of the, uh, some of the uh, civilizations of the Mediterranean and pointed out that a lot of them faced very harsh climates and simply organizing a civilization that could generate an agricultural economy that would support a large civilization was one of their first challenges. The Incas faced the same thing in Peru. But then of course the Incas fell to a more powerful invader, the Spanish, and they failed to meet that challenge. And that's the challenge we tend to think of and I suspect in institutions like this it is particularly the kind of challenge we think of, the kind of challenge that Hitler represented in World War II to the Western nations, the kind of challenge that the Soviet Union represented to us in the long Cold War. And we prevailed, prevailed against those challenges. In some ways, Toynbee suggests external challenges are easier to meet than internal challenges. And then he goes to take us inside a couple of the great civilizations on which we like to model ourselves, ancient Greece and ancient Rome. And what evolves is that ancient Greece and ancient Rome failed to meet the challenge from within. Toynbee writes about schisms in the body politic, Schism, uh, schisms in the, the soul of the society, internal schisms that in the end ripped the Greek city-states apart and they fell into fratricidal warfare over internal trade within the Greek city-state system. Rome fell in the same, and similarly, because of tensions, conflicts within, even within the Roman Senate, et tu brute, and so forth. So it's interesting, got me thinking about how we are. We have become, in my lifetime, we have become two Americas. We're divided today by power, by money, and by ideology. And no less a figure than Abraham Lincoln warned us that a house divided cannot stand. So it's the internal conflicts, it's the internal contradictions it seems to me we need to pay the most attention to today, not just because they're irritating, not just because they made the Admiral's job more difficult when he was working at the White House trying to deal with those unwieldy guys up on the hill. 
but because they go to the heart of whether or not we're going to be able to hold this society together and progress into the future, not just the next four or five years, but the next four or five decades and beyond. And there's another thing that Toynbee talks about that's really interesting relative to your concern about ethical leadership. And that is during the flowering of a great civilization as it's coming to its birth and beginning to generate its growth and its strength, you have what he calls the creative elite. Think of the era of our founding fathers. Creating not art, not music, not literature, but the institutions that we live with today, the constitution that we all revere and adhere to. And then he says over time, as civilizations move on and they get more mature, well, the most dangerous period is when the creative elite becomes the dominant elite. And by that he means and explains an elite that is interested primarily in the furtherance and the growth of its own power and wealth. Now we're coming home. Now we're coming home. America at the moment as one of the greatest concentrations of wealth the world has seen in a long time. It's not just liberal Keynesian economists who say that. It's not just a guy who used to work for the New York Times and a bunch of other journalists who say that. Citigroup put out a report to its most, its premier wealth clients in 2005, a glossy brochure, in which it said the world is run essentially today by plutonomies, not plutocracies, but plutonomies, economic plutocracies, if you will, economic oligarchies. And the biggest of these is America, and that's what makes America the best place to invest. And the advice was to invest not in companies that produce for the large middle class, or even the slightly less large, but more affluent upper middle class, but to concentrate your investments. This was their advice, concentrate your investments on the super rich companies that serve the super rich, that build the homes and gated communities, that build the luxury yachts, that stock Tiffany's and so forth. Why? Because so much purchasing power is concentrated in the top one or two percent. And then Citibank went on to say, the world has not seen such a concentration of wealth since 16th century Spain. And if we remember our history, we know what happened to 16th century Spain, 1588 and all that, Spanish Armada. Um, so it raises a serious question as to whether or not we have a healthy division of wealth. We have, we have economists now telling us not only is the concentration of wealth in America, which feeds a concentration of political power, which fuels a further concentration of wealth, which feeds a concentration of political power in America, and the use of money to influence the political process in ways that uh, are not unheard of before, but are in dimensions that had not been experienced before. Uh, and raises a question whether or not our democracy is going to continue to work effectively, or whether or not it's going to be stuck. What was bothering me specifically was how do we go from an era, and back in my early days as a reporter in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, where wealth was fairly widely shared in the middle class, shared in the prosperity of America, and we had effective bipartisan politics. Of course, we had poverty. Of course, we had business cycles. Of course, we had political fights and elections in which uh, the parties differed. But they did manage to pass major pieces of legislation, the Civil Rights Act, the, the uh, uh, Medicare bill. It's in Lyndon Johnson's day, got 65 House votes from Republicans and 13 Senate votes from Republicans. It is not to say that uh, uh, the Republicans, by the way, had their own alternative to Medicare, which has long since been forgotten, but it was not that far away from the Democratic alternative. Richard Nixon had a succession plan for Medicare, unlike the current political situation where as soon as Obamacare got passed, the idea has been to take it apart. There was a consensus in our political system that allowed the system to operate. Believe it or not, the budget, uh, the budget was actually passed every year. They passed a budget. Doesn't sound remarkable, but it is in today's political context. I notice there's only one fellow in the room laughing besides me. This fellow spent a lot of time in Washington trying to get budgets passed. Um, what happened? How do we get to polarized politics, highly unequal wealth, middle class stuck in the rut, an economy stuck in the rut, an economy stuck in the rut? 
Prior to 1990, it used to take us about 19 or 20 months to get from the bottom of a recession back to the level of unemployment that we had entering it. 1991 to 93, it took 26 months. 2001 to 2003, it took 46 months. We're now, what is it, 49 months in to this recovery, and we can't see the month at which we're going to be back at 5% unemployment. Something's structurally wrong. That isn't just the result of the last election or the last budget or the last fight or the guys on the other side of the aisle or the ladies on the other side of the aisle. Something more is going wrong. Something more is amiss. And I think we're in real trouble uh, trying to figure out what to do next if we don't understand more of how we got to where we were. Well, I went back and started to look to try to figure that out. And I was both excited and embarrassed at all the things I discovered. I've been covering this stuff, and I kept finding out things I didn't know. I didn't know that the main victims of, of the subprime crisis were people who deserved prime loans. Good credit risks, like the people sitting in this room, who got talked into, bamboozled into, cheated into, actually literally lied into and defrauded into uh, bad loans with high interest rates and high fees and the constant refinancing of their homes to the great benefit of the banks and not to the benefit of the homeowners. I didn't know that American homeowners had lost six trillion dollars before the housing boom hit bottom, mostly while it was going up. In the late 1980s, American homeowners owned 70 percent of the value of their homes, and banks owned the other 30 percent. In 2009, American homeowners owned 40% of the value of their homes, and the banks owned 60%. 30% of the value of the entire housing stock in America moved from homeowners to banks and to wealthy investors. As the boom was going up, we were taking $750 billion a year out of our home equity. That is what was powering the consumer demand that was driving growth. We as homeowners, as individuals, as middle class families, were spending out of our seed corn. And that was what was making the economy grow. In fact, Alan Greenspan, the head of the Fed, loved it. He talked of it, it's called equity extraction in the lingo of the bankers, just so you don't feel it. It's kind of like a doctor pulling one of your teeth, equity extraction, right? Equity extraction, you don't feel it but we wound up that much poorer. That's the single largest transfer of wealth in American history. And we're not talking trickle down economics, we're talking geyser up economics. We're talking about the Mississippi River flowing north financially, okay? It's enormous, so when I hit that, the idea of the stealing of the dream began to creep into my brain. I didn't know, for example, that the 401k plan was never intended to be a national retirement system. It was actually set up and written into law in 1978 by Barbara Conable, an upstate New York Republican, a very good guy, a legislator I knew quite well, as a favor to, to, to Kodak and Xerox, which had their headquarters in his district in Rochester. They wanted a tax shelter for, for long-term profit-sharing bonuses that could be set aside, mostly to be given to the big bonuses were going to go uh, to the executives, of course, but under IRS rulings, they had to give them to everybody in the company, and they did. By the way, that's not going on much anymore. The, the principle that if anybody gets a bonus, everybody gets a bonus, not operating very widely in American business today. But that's how the 401k got started. And it affected those two companies and a handful of New York banks, and that was it. And then later on, the Treasury Department under Reagan said, well, why don't we apply it to salaries as well as to annual bonuses? And then the mutual fund industry said, wow, if we could just get a hold of those, those funds and manage those funds instead of leaving those funds in pension plans, lifetime pension plans um, that were sitting in banks, we could make a lot of money. And they marketed it as power to the people, do it your own, do it yourself, retirement, so forth. and it took off. And then my last discovery that was kind of fundamental was to go back and, and, and be reminded that under Dwight Eisenhower, the maximum marginal tax rate in America was 92%. And under John F. Kennedy in the 60s, it was 77%. Now we had ups and downs in the business cycle, but three or 4% growth was pretty normal in those period, in that period. We'd give our IT for three or 4% growth today. 
we're now down to where, uh, setting aside the tax increase uh, to 39.6% uh, last January, which barely had an effect on the economy yet, for the decade of the 2000s, the maximum marginal tax rate was 35%. And we had the worst growth rate in seven decades. There is no connection, I discovered, between the maximum marginal tax rate and the growth of the economy. In fact, the Congressional Research Service was about to put out a report to that effect that said that uh, in the fall of 2012, but it got squelched by some Republican senators who didn't want it coming out during the campaign season. But that was their finding as well. So I thought, wow, there's some things going on here that are different from what I had thought. So I started to go back into that Eisenhower-Kennedy period in the 50s and 60s and look at things. And there were some things that stuck out in my own mind. Mr. Lucas kindly remembered my experience in the Soviet Union. I wasn't there in 59 when Richard Nixon was there, but I do remember the kitchen debate, that debate that took place in the American exhibit in Moscow when Nikita Khrushchev, the prime minister and, and head of the Soviet uh, Communist Party, and Nixon were having a debate about which society was doing a better job of building a better life for more people. And Nixon was bragging on about all the appliances and all the things that, that American homeowners and housewives had in their homes. And Khrushchev objected and said, well, we're building a classless society in the Soviet Union. And Nixon didn't pause for a moment, stuck his finger in Khrushchev's eye and said, we already have a classless society in America. And Nixon was exaggerating. But he was on to something that was important. He was on to what economists call the Great Compression. What they mean by that is the incomes of the people at the top are not that far from the incomes of the people in the middle, are not that far from people with the incomes at the bottom. Inequality of incomes is something that we have accepted in America and actually indeed embraced for good reason. There are people of genius, there are people of talent, there are people who work harder, there are people who work more hours. We accept inequality. The inequality at that time, say, could be represented by the fact that Charlie Wilson, CEO of General Motors, made roughly 40 times what the average assembly line worker made, 40 times. Today, it's more like 360, 380 times. So there's been an enormous change. So 40 to 1 was a reasonable relationship. In fact, if America today, as the society as a whole, adopted the kind of pay ratios of the military, we wouldn't have the high inequality that we have in the American private sector, in the American economy. Military is a very good model for us on that score. So there was this compression. There was this sense of shared prosperity. If you look at the growth of productivity in the American workforce from 1945 until about 1975, it roughly doubled. It rose 96.8%, according to the economists that I've read. And the median household income, remember, this is a household that is basically supported by one worker, not two. The median household income rose 95%. 97% growth in productivity, 95% growth in median household income. That means almost dollar for dollar as the company, as the country grew, as the economy grew. It literally was true that a rising tide lifted all boats and lifted them pretty much equally. As a matter of fact, economists have gone back and they've analyzed that period. They divide uh, the American population into quintiles, top 20%, next 20%, so on down to the bottom. The bottom three quintiles during that 30-year period that I've mentioned saw their incomes rise by a greater percentage in each of those three than the top two quintiles. But they all moved up roughly together. So this was a country in which growth, prosperity, efficiency, productivity, and corporate profits were widely shared. Now, why? Why? Two things came across to me that seem to me significant to today, very different from today. In the first place, the business leaders of that time believed it was their responsibility and it was smart business, good for them, their business, and good for the economy to share the wealth, to pay their people well. The guy who first kind of came up with that idea was Henry Ford, roughly a century ago in 1914 when he came up with the idea of the $5 day. He wasn't doing it just to be generous. He wasn't doing it just to be fair. It was smart business. He needed to keep workers on the payrolls, and he was losing workers to other companies. But he also reasoned that if he paid his workers well, they could actually afford to buy the Model Ts that Ford Motor Company was producing. Well, that's how, that's how uh, Charlie Wilson felt. 
some, you know, 40 years later at General Motors, and Reg Jones at General Electric, and Frank Abrams at, X, uh, at uh, Standard Oil of New Jersey, and Peter Drucker, the great management guru, voiced this idea that it was the, and they used these terms, it was the sacred trust, it was the obligation, it was the responsibility of the corporate leader, the CEO, to balance the interests of the various stakeholders in the corporation. Stakeholders, a very, very important word. What they meant by that was the people and the groups that had a stake in the survival of the corporation. Obviously the shareholders, but also the managers, also the workers, also the suppliers, the creditors, the customers, the communities in which they operate. They're balancing all those interests. So you had people who believed that was their, their function, their ethical leadership duty, if you will, and it was smart business, and it paid off. What we got from that was what economists call the virtuous circle of growth. Very important word, circle, because it means every part of the process is feeding the next part of the process, and it's circular. If you paid tens of millions of American workers well, and they went out and shopped and spent that money, and Americans don't save a great deal, so they spend most of it, if not all of it, then that drives industry to expand, build new plants, buy new equipment, hire more workers, pay more money, and so the circle goes on. It doesn't work perfectly, but it is a process that drives itself. So high pay and sharing the wealth, in fact, did deliver that enormously powerful and productive and growing economy uh, that we had in the post-war period. Isn't the only reason we came out of the war whole. Our enemies and even our allies came out destroyed, and it took them 15 years anyway until the early 60s before they could even seriously compete with but we went on for another decade and a half or more with this virtuous circle of growth, even in the face of growing competition, even with our share of, of uh, global trade cut in half from the post-war period. By 1960, we were about half of what we had been in 1945. So there was something going on internally that was really working well. The other thing that was really important to middle-class prosperity and shared prosperity in this growth is that the middle class exercised political power and economic power, something we've forgotten. We just passed Earth Day. Monday, right? Earth Day. I didn't notice a lot of noise in America on Earth Day this past Monday. Earth Day 1970, 20 million Americans went into the streets to protest the fouling of the nation's airways and waterways. And by the way, Chesapeake Bay right out here had a documentary on it. Talk to your one of your colleagues here, Howard Ernst, about it. Um, I did a documentary here about four years ago. The Chesapeake Bay is still in bad shape. The problem hasn't gone away. The phosphorus and nitrogen is still creating algae. The main stem of the Chesapeake Bay is still a dead zone. 40% of it's a dead zone in the middle of summer. Dead fish, all kinds of things are going on there. My subject is in the environment. My point is the problem hasn't changed, but human behavior has. 20 million people in the streets in the shopping malls, on college campuses, on the air, radio, television, debating, talking, um, angry, urgent, insistent. And what happened within a year, Congress passed seven major pieces of environmental legislation. Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, Safe Drinking Water Act, Anti-Toxic Substance Act, and on and on. And all signed by that great tree-hugging environmentalist, Richard Nixon. I knew Bill Ruckel's house well, the first head of the EPA. I said, Bill, tell me about Nixon and the environment. I said, how did he feel about it? Was it a big issue to him? He said, he said, in all the years I worked for Nixon, he said, he never once asked me a question about the environment. He never said, Bill, is it bad out there? Is it really true that if you put your arm in the Potomac River, it comes out covered with green slime? He said, is it air, is it air pollution from, from the autos? I mean, what's the problem? But he said, he did say to me, Bill, when you go over there, he said, don't get captured by those bureaucrats over at EPA. EPA. He said, Nixon was the only person in Washington who referred to EPA as EPA. So that's how connected he was to the issue. I said, I said, so why did he do it? He said, well, Nixon was a pragmatic politician. The people demanded it. The public demanded it. He was afraid Ed Muskie from Maine was going to be the Democratic nominee in 72. And Muskie was a big green environmentalist. And all these bills were passing Congress by very large bipartisan majorities. Very large. They had almost, some of them passed without a negative vote. But, that might have been in the Senate a few votes and in the House a few votes, negative. He said he was practical. We had to do something. The public was demanding it. We had to, government had to respond. That's the way democracy is supposed to work. 
Interesting idea. That's the way democracy is supposed to work. I'm trying to remember when the election of 2012 was held. Was it 1912 or 1812? Because the agenda of that election seems to be totally forgotten. There's a disconnect between Washington and the country. It's part of what we're talking about. I realize this is a long ways away sort of from where you guys are, but in fact it's right at the center of where you all have to live and how you have to operate and how to think and how you have to educate the young people that you have in your sacred trust right now here. This is the country they're in. They're defending and we've got to sort some of these big issues out. We're handing them the kind of mess that Charlie Brown had with his deck chair. So how do we get into this? How do we get into this mess? We had that sense of, of, of responsibility on the part of leadership. We had people out demonstrating. We had a strong trade union movement. People have forgotten that. The Treaty of Detroit 1948 agreement between the United Auto Workers and General Motors, between Charlie Wilson and, and uh, Walter Ruther, became a template, a model for the social contract for America for three or four decades. And basically, Charlie Wilson said he was tired of the wildcat strikes coming out of World War II. He wanted to get back to making cars and making money, and Walter Ruther said, fine, Mr. Wilson, we're up for that, but we would like to have steady pay, rising pay over the life of a five-year contract. We'd like to have a health benefit. We'd like to have a lifetime uh, pension benefit if we can, and have people make enough money they can make a down payment on their home in Levittown or wherever they live and make monthly payments every year so when they retire at 60 or 65, whatever the time is, they own their own home and they have secure retirement. But that, that, when I'm talking about who stole the American dream, it's that dream I'm talking about. It's that middle class dream of having a se economic security. And economic security, not just meaning a job and steady pay, but enough money to save to buy your own home to hope that your kids are gonna have a better education and a better life than you are. That was a pretty simple, pretty basic dream that an awful lot of people took for granted. And the numbers are out there. I won't bother you with them at the moment uh, to go back and take a look at What happened? Had a women's movement, had a consumer movement, uh, had a civil rights movement, an environmental movement, labor movement. All those movements represented middle class power. People in the streets, people in meetings with congressmen, people demonstrating what they wanted the government to do and the government responding. That contributed mightily to this period of growth, balanced growth that we had. What happened? But we had two big changes. One change occurred, lots of things happened, but we had two big changes. One occurred in the economy and one occurred in the political uh, arena. People in the business world were reacting to the middle class power that I've just been describing. And one of them was Lewis Powell, who was a famous corporate attorney back in the 60s and 70s. Nixon put him on the Supreme Court in 1971. He actually started serving in 72. Powell was an ardent advocate of the free enterprise system. Uh, he, was, he was vehemently anti-union, and he was very disturbed by the environmental movement. I mean, he mentions, he, he wrote a memo. He talked to guys, at the, his friends at the, United, at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and said, you know, business is getting taken to the cleaners in Washington, policy is working against uh, the interest of business. Uh, we need to fix that. Business needs to get active. And they said, why don't you write it down? Powell wrote his, what is now known historically as the Powell Memorandum in August of 1971. And basically what he said was to business, you are the forgotten people in Washington. You need to move into the political arena. You can't just operate in the marketplace. You've got to operate in the political marketplace. You've got to identify your enemies, go after them aggressively, stop fighting among yourselves, pool your resources, uh, raise money, uh, and get yourselves organized. What's astonishing is that's what happened. Uh, not because Powell was that influential, but because Powell articulated something that a lot of business leaders felt. The Chamber of Commerce circulated his memo to business leaders across the country, privately, because uh, I, I was running the New York Times Washington Bureau at that time and we knew nothing about it. In fact, most Washington journalists today still know nothing about the Powell memo. I learned it from historians. I didn't learn it from a, a news source. Uh, maybe I should be embarrassed to say that, but I'm happy to learn from historians. Um, <laughs> Uh, and hopefully there's a little exchange. <laughs> uh, well, what was amazing was the business roundtable, which, which we now take as a fixture of Washington politics, was formed within four or five months of Powell's memorandum. 150 largest corporations got together and said, hey, we've got to get the CEOs to go down to lobby Washington. Not members of Congress, but committee chairman, the speaker, majority leader, the president, the vice president, people at the apex of government. And they're extremely effective and influential in doing that. 
National, Cha National Association of Manufacturers moved their headquarters from Chicago to, to Washington. At the time Powell wrote, there were 170 companies that had offices in Washington uh, to interact with the government. Uh, eight years later, there were 2,425. There were 50,000 people working for business trade associations by the 1980 elections, before Reagan was elected. Uh, there were 9,000 registered corporate lobbyists. Today, there are 12,000. But there were enough to have 130 lobbyists for every single member of Congress and every member of the Senate. Uh, and then 8,000 corporate PR people. There was an army. I call it Powell's army, to make it simple for people to follow. But they had immediate impact as they began to get organized. And you see it, it's interesting to me, uh, that the pivotal Congress in, in the last 50 years was not the Congress of 1981 under Reagan. <coughs> But the pivotal Congress was the 1978 Congress when Jimmy Carter was in the White House and the Democrats were in control. The anti-business Congress of the early 70s became the pro-business Congress of the late 70s, largely because of Powell's army, also because a number of Democrats had won seats in formerly Republican districts, and they were very nervous about their prospects for re-election. They'd, they'd won those seats in the wake of the water, uh, Watergate crisis, Watergate scandal. So you began to see the 401k gets written into law, the corporate bankruptcy law gets changed to the great advantage of corporate management and the great disadvantage of, of unions and rank and file employees. <clears throat> uh, the deregulation begins in telecommun telecommunications and trucking. Uh, the bills that labor and the consumer movements had wanted to get passed in the Democratic Congress got bottled up in the Congress. They never got out of the Congress. The tax system got changed. Jimmy Carter had wanted to uh, close some loopholes on, on wealthy taxpayers. Um, and to drop some less wealthy, uh, drop lower income people off the tax rolls and had wanted to raise the corporate tax rate a couple of percentage points uh, to help uh, balance the budget. When the tax bill came back from Congress, it went exactly the opposite way. The corporate tax rate went down 2% rather than up. The loopholes were not closed. The capital gains rate was dropped from 48% to 28%. Single biggest change in the capital gains rate in the last 50 years occurred in that Congress. And as we know, capital gains uh, rates affect all investors, but today 50% of the capital gains uh, uh, realized in the stock market are realized by the top 1% income earners in the country. So they benefit people at the top. So you began to see a policy tilt, which got carried forward and accelerated under Reagan, backed off a bit under Clinton, and then moved uh, uh, forward again under George W. Bush. The tax cuts under Reagan and under Bush probably added $4 trillion to the wealth of the top 1% in this country. Um, if we divided the income in America today the same way we divided it in that earlier period that I was talking about from 45 to 75, the bottom 80% of the public would get $750 billion a year more and the top 1% would get $675 billion less. Obviously, those aren't my numbers. I get them from other economists. I, I'm, from, I'm not other economists. I get them from economists. Uh, I'm not an economist. But something is very striking in the economy. Remember before I said productivity went up 97%, median household income went up 95%. In the period from 75 to now, to 2011, productivity went up 80% for the whole American workforce. The median household income went up 10%, 80 and 10. And the reason it went up 10% is more women worked more hours. Census Bureau told us last year that if you looked at men alone, working age men, hourly compensation, which is pay and benefits combined, that in 2011, it was dead even with what it was in 1978. Dead even, adjusted for inflation. In fact, it was a little tiny bit lower in 2011, but when you round it off, it comes out dead even. I call it wedge economics. I used that term in the first draft of my book. My editor said, Rick, where'd you get this term wedge economics? Did you get it from the Keynesian economists? Did you get it from the, did you get it from the Chicago School, Milton, Milton Friedman? I said, no, I made it up. She said, you can't make up a term about economics. You're not an economist. I, sa I said, I'm a communicator, and I'm trying to find a Twitter-friendly bumper sticker phrase that people can understand as a wedge driven in the middle of the American economy. And if you're at that wedge, you didn't go anywhere. If you're below that wedge, you actually went backwards. If you're above that wedge, you went up a little bit. If you're way above that wedge, if you were a CEO, your pay went up 350 to 400% over that 30-year period. If you're at the top 1% of incomes, your, your income went up 600%. If you're right at that wedge, it went zero. If you're below that wedge, your income actually went down. 
Um, that's what happened, um, partly as a result of those policies, but also as a result of the change in the business ethos. We no longer have leaders, by and large, and we still have some corporate leaders, at Costco and at Whole Foods, and, um, and for a long time at Motorola under Bob Galvin, and at Toro uh, Lawnmower Company, and some others, at Johnson & Johnson, uh, specific companies that still kind of operate on the stakeholder principle. But by and large, our corporate leaders have now moved to shareholder capitalism, which is their mission, their mission, which is something you all pay a great deal of attention to, mission, is to deliver the highest return to shareholders. That means getting the stock price to rise as fast as you can and getting profits up. And there is a zero-sum game between profits and wages. So if you're pushing the profits up, you're holding the wages level. Last year, Caterpillar Attractor made $4.9 billion in profits. At the same time, their union struck and asked for a wage increase to share in the profits. Economically, the management and the corporation of Caterpillar were more powerful than their local unions, which is not an unusual occurrence in today's America, and they insisted on a wage freeze. So none of that money went to wages, but that money all went. It went somewhere. It went to the CEO and it went to the top executives in the form of, of, of uh, stock options and stock grants, it went in dividends to the shareholders, but a huge chunk of it went to buying back company stock, which has the effect of raising the price. Apple is doing it right now. Last year, at a time when people said you couldn't raise taxes because it would deprive business of the money it needs to expand, American companies spent $550 billion of their accumulated cash flow buying back their own stock. They were not short of cash. That wasn't the problem. We're short of demand. That's where the problem is. Because the workers are not getting, the middle class is not getting a, uh, the level of employment we've had in the past, and they're not getting their share of the pay that we've had in the past, we are not having an economy that drives well. We're having an economy that does what I just said to you before. It's taking now 48 months 50 months, 60 months, 65 months to get out of the hole we got into back in 2008. So we have for political reasons and economic reasons, and I've run out of time here, so I need to stop and head towards the end. Uh, but if you're interested, um, I can't sell books on the, on, on, the, on, on the academy's yard, but there are good bookstores somewhere around in this area. So I would encourage you if you're interested, and I hope, I actually hope that some people will teach from this. I was pleased last night that the, the chair of your political science department said he was still using video from my uh, PBS documentary on the power game and that Mitty's really identified with it. I've tried to write a book that is not just economics and politics but really goes out in the country. You've got live people in it, jet airline mechanics and, and, uh, and computer programmers and small business people, um, people working in factories all, all across the country, different kinds of people, homeowners and so forth. The question is, what do we do about this now? And I, have, I haven't, even, haven't even dealt with uh, the issue that is so important to you all. And that is what we do in the world. What's our role in the world? What's the balance between what our economy needs domestically and what we need to do abroad? I quote only Dwight Eisenhower's State of the Union Address in February 1953. To amass military power without regard to our economic capacity would be to defend ourselves against one kind of disaster by inviting another. And that's why you had mayors, you know, last year uh, at their meeting saying, how about building bridges in Kansas City instead of Kandahar? Uh, you know, we have, a, we have a close to a thousand bases around the world. Some of them we certainly need, absolutely. But others, are they out there like that consulate in Benghazi that are, are potential tripwires to trouble? Do they really make sense? I'm not just talking about money. Um, you all are familiar, I'm sure, with the writings of Paul Kennedy, the rise and fall of great powers, imperial overstretch, like the shift from a creative elite to a dominant elite, is one of the hallmarks of a society and a civilization heading into decline. Think 16th century Spain, think 19th century Britain. Overreaching sucking more out of the domestic economy than it can support at a time when the domestic infrastructure is in trouble. I was both amused and saddened by the news this morning that Congress has decided quickly to fix the sequester by granting the FAA the authority to shift funds from 
airport construction to preventing the furloughs of its air, air traffic controllers. It's going to solve the immediate problem of the nuisance of our sitting on flight lines longer than we want. And it's going to avoid and prevent the modernization of our airports. You know, just as an aside, uh, I spent some time in China in recent years. When I went to China in 1994, there was no port. There was no modern port of Shenzhen. Shenzhen is now the third or fourth largest port in the world. It's been built since 1994. It is bigger than Los Angeles, Long Beach, and San Francisco combined. It has all the most modern technology, much of it, by the way, produced inside China. Our ports aren't as no modern as that. Our airports are in disastrous shape. It isn't just liberals. It isn't just the government spenders. The US Chamber of Commerce, former California Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger, as well as former Pennsylvania Governor Ed Rendell, one Republican, one Democrat. Kay Bailey Hutchinson, Republican Senator of, of Texas. And John Kerry, former Republican, uh, Democratic Senator from, from uh, Massachusetts. And the AFL-CIO and the Chamber of Commerce are all saying, we are losing a trillion dollars worth of growth. We are losing American competitiveness by failing to invest in upgrading our own infrastructure. Do you know it takes longer to move a freight train through the city of Chicago than it does through the city of Chicago because of bottlenecks than it does to move it from Los Angeles to Chicago. So if you guys are thinking about how you handle the military bases in this country, let alone around the world, you wouldn't run a logistical system that way. So there are things we need to do, and that's where I need to end here. Um, my editor said, Rick, you've described a bad situation. You've got us in a ditch. You've got to help us out. I said, look, I'm a reporter. My job is to call balls and strikes, foul and fair, um, <laughs> investigate, tell the story the way it is. And it's up to the policymakers and the think tanks and, and the Congress and the people to decide. She said, no, you can't do that. You've got to do something. We went back and forth. And finally, my chief editor, my wife, Susan Zock, said, Rick, you've got to do what Kate said. So I did it. And at the end of my book, you've got a 10-step Smith program to save America. I'm joking about that because I'm a little embarrassed about it. But the, some of the things to do in America, to level the tax system so we don't reward companies for moving jobs overseas with a lower tax rate than those that operate in America, bailing out the homeowners as well as bailing out the banks, you know, modernizing our infrastructure, they're all, they're spending more on R&D. Innovation is the heart of, has been the heart of America's growth. We've been shrinking R&D spending in this country. And it isn't just me that's saying it. The National Academy of Scientists is saying it. You know, a great industrialists like Norm Augustine, the longtime CEO of Lockheed Martin, all kinds of people are saying, hey, we've got to get smart about building our future in this country. But I don't think those things are really going to happen unless we change our political system, which is broken. We've got a gerrymandered elect electoral system, which is not only producing lopsided results that don't accord with people's votes. There were more votes for House members, uh, Democratic members of the House in, in November 2012 than there were Republicans, but the Republicans wound up with a 33-vote majority in the House. It's partly gerrymandering. It's not all gerrymandering, but part of it's gerrymandering. Gerrymandering produces polarized districts, safe seats for both parties where you get more extreme candidates in each party, and then when they get to the Washington, they can't talk. We've destroyed the political middle in this country. We need to restore it. Open primaries, fixing gerrymanders. But basically, I believe we've got to get back to the middle class getting re-engaged in politics today. You've got the cream of the middle class here, and they're engaged in public life and public interest. They've got the spirit. It is patriotism, but it's also personal involvement. It's personal engagement. We have to get back to that all across the country. Now, you all are engaged in your professional work in a way that, that most audiences I talk to aren't. But it's a message I try to take everywhere. Um, I'm really worried about our country. I really care about it. And I think we have to think about it in different ways than we have before. We've got to step out of where we are standing or sitting in our own personal lives and take a look at the whole enterprise and see whether or not it makes sense. The way it's going right now, I don't think it does. Thank you. I'll let you field your own questions, sir. We have time for, uh, for at least uh, two or three questions, so please. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. That's fantastic. I, I have to have a quote strategic plan for the town. And a list of funding sources, for example, a property tax, a property tax, <coughs> and individuals. 
I'd like to hear your 10 steps quickly, but that'd be one of them. <laughs> well, I, I, uh, thank you very much, sir. Uh, well, I just mentioned a couple. Number one, I think we need to level the, the corporate uh, tax rates so that they're not loopholes that actually make it advantageous to move production abroad. I think that doesn't make sense. So there are roughly $1.2 trillion worth of corporate tax loopholes in the, in the uh, tax code at the moment. I think modernizing our infrastructure is absolutely essential. We are, we are losing competitiveness every month. Uh, you know, the Chinese are just way ahead of us and lots of others are, partly because they've leapfrogged. I mean, they developed so late, they were able to go into modern technologies without having to go through some of the things we built over the last 50 years. Eisenhower built the interstate state highway system 50 years ago. It's just about 50 years old. And I mean, there's just all kinds of reports all over the place from the Society of Civil Engineers and so forth that just tell us our roads are in terrible shape. We're wasting enormous amounts of time sitting in traffic because of potholes and badly constructed roads. You know, so it's, it means it's very inefficient. But we're in a mode of thinking right now that we can invest for the future. What are you doing right here at the Academy? You're investing in the future. You're building an, a core of absolutely wonderful young people to serve this country in the future. We're investing in them. I mean, I'm, as far as I know, the education here is free or pretty close to free, right? Well, somebody's paying for it. We're paying for it because we think it's worthwhile. Families do it. They think it's worthwhile. We buy homes. We're not investing long term now. We need to do that. I think that's important. Uh, we need to do something about China and its manipulation of currency. We need to get together with other countries and, and get the currency situation fixed so, so that we don't have an artificial balance of trade with the Chinese. Um, we need to do some of the things the Germans are doing. If you take a look at the global situation, the Germans are facing the same kind of competitive pressures that we are. The cheap Chinese labor, Indians moving in the internet, so on and so forth. They've managed to keep 21% of their workforce in manufacturing. We have only 9% of our workforce in manufacturing. Very important for the health of the economy. Very important for defense. Very important not only for the workers who have the jobs, but the engineers and the designers and the marketers and the CEOs and everybody else who depends on it. Has, they have huge uh, you know, multiplier effects. I mean, we, we need to be thinking about how we build the future instead of arguing about where we are at, at the moment and arguing about side issues. Um, I can't go through them all. Uh, but, and then I, I understand, these are, except for the politics, these really aren't my ideas. I just went around and looked at sensible ideas that I thought other people had. And in many instances, there really, are, there really is some bipartisan support, not wide bipartisan support, but people on both sides of the aisle. I don't really care politically about either party. I just think in the nation, we need to get, we need to pull together the way we used to. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, what do you see as the future for unions in this country? Pretty dim at the moment. Um, it, 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 it will be very interesting to see what happens if, in fact, the immigration bill passes in the kind of rough outline that we have. I say that because um, a lot of the people who are going to get on a path to citizenship and, uh, are, are going to be working service jobs that can't be exported. And they are potentially prime targets for organizing for labor. And I'm one of those who believes that it is actually healthy. I know a lot of people in the country don't. I think it's healthy to have strong unions. I think unions have made lots of mistakes. I think there's been feather bedding. I think the idea that public sector unions can insist on a retirement age of 55, which they negotiated 30 years ago, it doesn't make sense in a world in which life uh, expectancy is expanding. We need to change those. But I think you know, intelligent union leaders understand that, and they need to move their constituency along. But I think that would be healthy. Uh, but I, if they're certainly um, under enormous pressure. When unemployment is high, <laughs> when, company, when the tax system uh, is helping people move jobs overseas, it's very difficult to organize. It's very difficult to get people to to go on strike or to exercise their, their bargaining power. And if they do, they don't have reserves, so they're, they're not very muscular. I mean, I, ironically, we need to get back to a stronger economy so we can get a stronger union movement, which can help bolster over the long term a stronger economy. I don't think we necessarily have to go back to the kind of classes that we had before. I think there, there are union leaders that I, I talk to, some of them anyway, are, are much smarter than they used to be. But I have to say, I've done programs on American education and talking to the NEA and talking to the American Federation of Teachers often is very different. There's two teachers unions and they have very different attitudes about it, ways to improve academic uh, performance and that kind of stuff. Yes, sir. Um, you, in, in looking at this historical sweep of the last half century, uh, you wondered exactly where the, uh, the ethos of the responsible corporate leadership, the ethical leadership went. And it seems to me you mentioned uh, Milton Friedman's name in passing. Right. Isn't it possible to say that 
that the critique of that very style of leadership in the 70s, led by him, uh, on principal grounds, I add, uh, sure. but, but certainly arguing that, that such leaders were essentially usurping government functions uh, by worrying about all of these constituencies, the constituency about which they should worry was the owners of their corporation right. generating wealth for them, who would then spend it, presumably, on uh, uh, philanthropy and, uh, uh, and, and uh, you know, generate wealth that way or distribute the wealth that way. And it seems like that hasn't happened. And the other piece in the 70s was the critique of labor unions, that, uh, sure. that they had strangled, blaming them for having strangled right. the economy with high wages and benefits with, with an absence of productivity. Well, I, I think if you look at the facts behind those arguments, you will see that what was going on was, as I suggested, more of the benefits, more of a share of the growth and the profits were going to labor than people who were in charge of capital like. So they raised those arguments. I don't think there's any question that it's true that there were unions that had well overplayed their hands and there was a legitimate argument the other way. But I think the real argument was there was too much money going to the workers and not enough money going to the shareholders. So it, the other argument is, and the Friedman argument, at least as I understand it to some degree, is that it's very difficult to measure a CEO's effectiveness when there are multiple yardsticks by which to judge him. And if you have a single yardstick of a maximum return to shareholders, it's very simple. And, and that's accurate. That's true. But leadership has always been a tricky proposition. And, you know, I mean, I don't imagine that a commander of a naval vessel would get um, high marks just for the number of rounds of artillery that the battleship fired. <laughs> you know, I mean, you, there's the morale of the troops, there's the positioning of the I mean, there's just a whole lot of other things. And I, I think what happened was it got too simple. Michael Jensen, who was an associate professor of business at Harvard Business School, who was a student of Friedman's, was the guy who came up with the idea of pay for performance. The idea was, that if you link the, the pay of the CEO to the concerns, interests, and benefits of the shareholders by paying them in, ca in shares, that they, would, uh, uh, that they would perform better. Well, there are all kinds of ways to game the system. In the first place, there, there are over eight or 900 corporations that actually manipulated the dates that shareholders, the shares were granted in order, in order even when the, the share went down, the, the, the company CEO wanted to get paid, so they backdated the, the, the date of the issuance of the shares to a time when the share price was lower. I mean, people just did outrageous things. And even Jensen, in the end, uh, wound up by calling the system uh, um, managerial heroin. So the system, I mean, that's Jensen here. Uh, however, he didn't suggest junking the system. It was managerial. So I think what happened is the standard was way too simple. And I don't think it's unrelated to the Pew poll that I cited this morning. There's enormous mistrust of American business among average people today. Now, what are they doing about it? They can't exercise it except to complain. But maybe they're exercising it by being less productive, less committed to the job. I mean, I don't know what the costs are. I haven't analyzed that. But there, there, there are some. Yes, sir. Last question, sir. Uh, go ahead, Rick. Fantastic talk. I like that very much. Um, I'm curious, though, you, you say that there's a, a, a national feeling against management against business management at the same time there's a national feeling against unionization right sure. and i think that i I'm, I'm glad to hear you say that the unions may have overplayed their hand during the 1970s uh, gm for example right now what percentage of what gm pays is actually paid to workers who are no longer producing anything because of the expansive uh, uh benefits package that they offered at the height of of uh, the power of the united auto workers but what i see in all of this is the problem of management wanting to offshore jobs for the sake of their shareholders because they can get cheaper wages and better benefit packages overseas, and at the same time, the unions are pushing them in that direction because they, they keep clamoring for a larger share of the pie. How do you square this? Even without tax policies, which I'm, I don't know how much tax policy is actually pushing jobs overseas. I think it's just a natural thing. The rising tide of the world capitalist economy is lifting all of the boats, but that means that if our workers have been overpaid on a global scale, our workers' wages have to come down. How in the world do you combat that? All right, well, let, let's take apart some of the things you said. In the first place, if you talk to industrialists today, as opposed to the mid-80s, 
mid-80s after the Plaza Accord, when there were major readjustments in Asian currencies, uh, because the Reagan administration basically jawboned the Japanese, the Taiwanese, the Koreans, and others to raise the value of their currency, because we were suffering a serious balance of trade problem then. China dropped its currency at that point. People didn't notice it because it wasn't that big a player. At that point, wages made a lot of difference. But if you talk to the top leaders of American industry today, they're not going to tell you that Chinese wages are what's moving the jobs overseas. Craig Barrett of Intel, I'll just pick him as one example, says, I can build a chip fab in China for a billion, a, a billion dollars less than I can in America. It has nothing to do with wages. Why? I, I, let me finish. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> um, you get, they get grants of free land or land for virtually nothing. From whom? From the Chinese government, okay? They get the roads, the electricity, the power, the water, all the things they need for a factory, dirt cheap, next to nothing, okay? And then they get tax abatement for 15 years. It is capital cost that is continuing to pull uh, American, and not only American, German, French, others overseas. I mean, the Jap and there's a question of whether or not what the Chinese are doing is legal under the World Trade Organization. But no company wants to take the Chinese <laughs> on or they'll never get any Chinese business. And so they go to the, the White House and they ask the White House when the Chinese leader comes over here, lean on the Chinese leader, which actually Obama did the last time Hu Jintao was over here. Uh, but you have to have a continuing push on it. It's a question of whether or not we should, should challenge the Chinese on that kind of stuff. But it's, it's largely subsidies now. It's not, and in many goods, the percentage of the cost of the good uh, that goes to labor is actually quite low. So the labor differential is, is no longer what it used to be. In fact, there are actually even some jobs, there's a trickle, not many, some jobs are actually coming back from China because that equalization of wages that you were talking about has occurred. They aren't equal, but they're close enough to each other so that other costs such as investment costs Energy. and transport costs and actually having your, your production near your engineering and your innovation uh, facilities, which is very important to modern uh, manufacturing, uh, are, are the drivers. Let's actually talk about the union. Uh, at, at General Motors. It's very interesting what's happened since the auto bailout. It's a great example of actually what's good about the American economy right now. What happened was that the, um, the, the, the trade unions, UAW, uh, with the American auto worker, uh, automakers, particularly GM and Ford, said, uh, look, we want you not, they had already laid out plans to move more plants to Mexico. So we want you not to move those plants to Mexico. We want you, after the bailout, and as you recover, to keep those jobs in America. And management came back and said, all right, we'll do that if you will accept two-tier pay. Two-tier pay means the old, workers, the old workers got virtually no increase in their pay over the life of this next contract, three or four year contract, I forget how long it is. And new workers got hired at a lower level, which historically has been anathema to trade unions. They did not want to do it. But they were so interested in keeping the jobs here in America and also helping GM and Ford get back on their feet that they agreed to it with an escalator clause that those, that those new workers would have more rapid wage increases over the next five or ten years than existing workers. So there was a give and take which was really unusual. The two sides were beginning to get together and saying, unions were saying, the survival of GM and Ford matters enough to us that we're going to make some sacrifices here. And the management said, all right, we'll keep the jobs here if you guys will agree uh, to hold the wages down. So I, that, that, it seems to me, is the kind of pattern of sensible negotiation that we need to the benefit of all parties. And it is happening in some places now. Um, I, I think it happened in the auto industry because they, they went over the brink and, and came back. And so they've all kind of seen the valley, the valley of the shadow of death. Uh, and they, and, but I think that kind of sensible negotiation is, is precisely what we need. And, and I think it's possible to do. I mean, both management and labor saw that as being to their advantage and it's certainly to the, to the nation's advantage. So I would agree with you, adjustments need to happen, but they, in, in real life, they are happening in some places. But f part of it takes a mindset on both sides that's different from what we had before. I wish I had time to talk to you about Germany because the collaboration between management and labor and between the public and the private sector in Germany is one of the secrets why Germany is bailing everybody else out and has been doing so well um, and why they've been able to keep so many manufacturing jobs over there. I mean, some sense of collaboration, we're all in this together and there's something here that's important to all of us that we need to protect. It's really essential for them and now I think for us. Thank you very much.
Wow, uh, that was uh, powerful, and I, I think we've uh, now had the opportunity to take a look at some of those extraordinary national challenges we're looking at and the ethical dimensions of happen right here in our own backyard. And uh, because the, uh, the virtuous circle of growth requires those at the top to be more selfless than selfish, that uh, what we have is the, uh, the Stockdale Center is a compass for you. We like to call it the moral compass. In your case, yours is Peg North. It doesn't move. But, uh, <laughs> but when people come in your, uh, into your office or, or you're out and you're talking to them uh, to get that virtuous circle of growth or wealth moving, to get that balance in place, it's uh, when you're selfless, your compass normally, ethical compass points, points toward the north. So on behalf of the center, uh, thank you, sir, for a great presentation. Good luck. Thank you very much.